name is Gregory G. Gomez. That's my white people name, my Christian name. I have a couple of sacred names that have been given to me over the years. In 1974, we were having a youth conference out at Window Rock, Arizona for the tribal people, and a young woman whose last name is So Claw asked me in the afternoon if I had plans. Of course, being peyote, I said, yeah, my plan is to eat and sleep whenever I get to it. And she asked me if I had ever been out there on the reservation, and I said, no. So she invited me, and we took a long drive to Canyon de Shea. And as it turns out, one of her grandfathers was a healer, and he did medicine out there close to Spider Rock. And he did a coming home ceremony for me. And I never said anything to him about Vietnam, but I guess he looked at me and understood and saw whatever. And he gave me the name, He Who Fights Against Evil Spirits. And so I have kept that name since July of 74. I was in and out of Oklahoma as an individual Indian person, and then my first job with the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, I was assigned Oklahoma, New Mexico as my states to deal with the tribal governments and the state agencies in the area of child welfare, runaway and homeless youth, abuse, neglect, foster care, adoption, etc. As I said, I had been in and out of Oklahoma a lot for powwows and basketball and softball tournaments, and I had the honor and privilege of meeting a lot of people. Sammy Tonki I. White, who was an incredible MC for most of his adult life, and I became friends in July of 76. He took me into the Southern Cheyenne Arapaho Starhawk Warrior Society, and that's when I began to officially, formally, traditionally gore dance. In February of 1980, when I returned from the Bay Area to Dallas to my old job, I was taken in by George Tabone Sr. his Kiowa, and he took me into the Kiowa Taipei. So Kathy, the children, and I used to go up to Oklahoma for powwows and tournaments or just to visit, but summertime we would go to the ceremonies that the Taipei had. Along that time of the 70s, I met a Creek elder. He was a Baptist minister. He was an NAC practitioner. He was a sun dancer and a very good man. And those of you that know who I'm talking about, Marcellus Bearheart Williams, he was short in stature, but he had a booming voice, kind of reminded me of Chairman Tino from Mescalero. So I was around Sammy a lot. I was around Marcellus a lot, professionally and personally. When I retired in 95 and moved out here to Albuquerque, Marcellus was living not too, too far out in Rio Rancho, so I would go visit with him. I got to know and became real good friends with my little sister, Joyce Bacogi Creek. And I really don't remember if she and her sister Pauline, who was a director at the Gallup Indian Center, were born out here or raised out here. But anyway, they knew Marcella. So a lot of times I would call Joy up and say, hey, little sis, you want to go see Grandpa? So we would go. So over the years, Marcellus and I got to be closer. One of my Indian Way sisters, Nanette Waller Osage, who got her master's in social work at UT Arlington, which is where I got mine in 74, took over NAN, Native American Alaska Native FAA organization, and for years they were, and might still be, the premier federal Indian employees organization or association. So Eddie Sandoval, Apache, and I helped her put that together, and consequently they would invite me every year 
to come and do training of different kinds and also do talking circle or whatever was needed that I could help. As a consequence of that, they met Marcellus and asked me to bring him to their national once a year meeting so I would invite him ahead of time and he went to four or five different ones including the one held here in Albuquerque. In early 2000 he was in Dallas through Linda Durant who he knew, they knew each other and Linda and I were very good friends. She called us up and said Marcellus is in town. I'm having lunch for him tomorrow. I've invited Peggy and Larry Larney and I'd love for you guys to come. So we went. Our children were little. So we had a, a wonderful time and he was in and out of Dallas several times through Linda and Mary Helen Deer who's also Creek. But after I moved out here that we sp started spending more time together I asked him one time if I could call him uncle and he said hmm uncle does that mean i'm going to be a monkey's uncle hey. <laughs> so he became my uncle but in the early 80s we started an institute which is now the indigenous institute of the americas and margaret donnelly who basically was funding that out of her pocket asked me if I would invite him to come down and do a keynote and be there as a healer and medicine man. So he came down. We had a two-day ceremony at the uh, Fort Worth Livestock. And then Saturday night, she hosted a dinner, a banquet, and she asked me to introduce him. So, of course, I did. And I'm standing off behind him right behind his right shoulder. He does his prayer, talks about what he's talking about, and then he says, there's a young man here whom I have known for quite a few years, been around him at different things, and he talked about some of the things that he had been involved with. He said, and here in front of all of these dignitaries, because there were a lot of political dignitaries, especially from Venezuela, but other countries, and you native people know that in our traditions, we adopt each other. So I have seen this young man for many years, different places, and in front of everybody here, I want to adopt him. So he turned around and face me and stretched his right arm out and I of course I was just blown away. I got teary eyed. I stepped up. He put his arm around me, did a ceremonial prayer in his language and then told the people that I was his son. He said, you know, my son got killed in 1964 as part of what was happening in Vietnam. And then my family, the NAC family in Oklahoma, when that happened, they gave me a son. And a few years ago, we were doing ceremony and some young Indian men came and were being rowdy. Crooked spirit took over and they killed him. So I have been without a son, but I have a son now. And I told the people when I could talk about how honored I was. I said, you know, my dad died in 1968. When I was in Vietnam, I came home a little early for his funeral, but now I have a dad. So to make a long story short, as the years progressed, here in Albuquerque, we kept seeing each other. I would take my little sister, Joyce Pacogi, with me a lot of times. But before he died, he gave me his name, Bearheart. So I use that sometimes, Gregory Bearheart Gomez. And those are the two names that I use in a traditional way that I share with people as I am right now. I would like to think that those things that came to me, names, ceremonial law, knowledge, sun dance, are not because I saw it, because I wanted, but because somebody saw something, felt something that made me worthy. And in that sense, I was brought in. We as Indian people, especially those of us that was raised 
in a traditional way with their ceremonies. My father's father, whose legal name we didn't find out till he died, was Charles Eli Gomez, and of course everybody knew him as Papa Elias. And he was the youngest of the first wife. When that wife died, the old man, my great-grandpa, remarried. So I knew a lot of my grandparents from both wives, my dads and moms, because in our traditions and culture, we don't have aunts and uncles. All the brothers and sisters of our grandparents are grandparents. All the brothers and sisters of our parents are parents. We don't have cousins. They're brothers and sisters. That's the way I was raised. That's what I believe, and that's what I try and practice. So I have DNA and Indian Way family that are very, very important to my life and my family in Indian country, because without them, life would be even more difficult than it is, because their love and prayers, their concern, is part of what I learned and grew up with in creation. There were times when I grew up doing migrant work, so we did a lot of traveling, but there were a couple of long trips that my mom and my siblings took, and I stayed with my dad. I love my dad, and I love being around him. So Grandpa would come and stay with us, and I learned a lot from watching him, from listening to him, and asking questions. And one of the things that I have shared with people over the years the old people would say, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is you give thanks to Great Spirit. You give thanks to Creator because you've been given a new day, a new lifetime. You have been allowed to awaken from the little death, which is what they referred to as sleep. So that's part of what I grew up with. My dad was a hunter. We basically were raised when we were home around my mom's Lapan Apache people down in what is now present-day Padu Island, white people's way, Rio Grande Valley. And it's funny, my brother Chico and I used to laugh and tease him because you guys talk of being from the valley as if it's the only valley that exists. <laughs> and uh, now I reside in the South Valley of Albuquerque, but that's another story. So I learned a lot of what I know, what I grew up with from my dad's dad who was born in 1878. I remember his rolling a cigarette in a corn husk for ceremonial purposes, and he would like that cigarette and blow the smoke up down to Mother Earth, the four directions in the sacred hoop. I really don't remember asking him what it was about, but I knew now from what I was growing up with and had grown up with already what he was doing. He never smoked, never drank alcohol, lived a very healthy, happy life, Till he died, his wife, my grandma, whom I didn't know, was also Apache. And the horses bolted. The wagon flipped over in an embankment, and she wound up breaking her neck and dying. So I never knew her, and he never remarried. But so over the years, as I have grown, as I have traveled, listened to people, especially our people, doing the different kind of ceremonies, it's been like I'm home. Because I have found that, for me at least, in Indian country, we're not strangers. We're part of the people. My mom's people are Tetsande'e. Hende'e is the Apache word for the people. That's who we are. Tetsande'e means big water people because of the Gulf Coast. So the Lapan Apache ranged primarily from present-day central Texas down to the areas of Monterey, Old Mexico, and then some north and west into Chihuahua, present-day Chihuahua, Old Mexico, and mixed and mingled with the Mescalero. On that side of the family, I'm a descendant of Negoyani. Negoyani in our language means old man of wisdom. And Chief Gomez is written up in the military history as having terrorized the San Antonio Road 
from present day San Antonio, Texas into El Paso and down into Chihuahua. And I always chuckle because when you're fighting for your land and your people, you're not a terrorist, you're a warrior. And so Negroyani is written up in history as Chief Gomez. So that's where my Mescalero bloodline comes from. Unfortunately, starting with the 13 original colonies, a lot of our people wound up being placed on reservations. A lot of our people wind up fighting for the British or the French or the Americans, and they kept pushing us further and further west. Oklahoma has 39 federally recognized tribes and one reservation, and that's the Osage people. So Osage County in Oklahoma is a reservation two feet below topsoil. That means that anybody can go into Oklahoma, Osage County, and buy and own land, but only the top two feet, which means that all the mineral rights, water rights, etc., belong to the Osage people. A lot of people don't know, including Indian people, is that the first case that the FBI worked on was because non-Indian people were coming into Oklahoma, killing off the Osage and claiming head rights. So that's part of our history, part of our heritage, part of what has, has and is still happening to us. When I talk to people, one of the things that I say is that we, indigenous people, North Pole to South Pole, have experienced and lived and survived this generational trauma. Uh, who I have spoken. I'm going to ask, because uh, you know Dr. Gonzalez, there is the Pot Kruger Guiding Values, and that's listed as respect responsibility, relationship, reciprocity, regeneration, and redistribution. I know that you were a part of that, a part of the six guiding values. So what can you tell me? <laughs> well, the first thing I'm going to do is say thank you, Sister Patricia, who's Kikuku Comanche, and now what has been one of my sisters for generations, and I have value who she is and what she does. So when she called me up and explained to me what the Alancia was doing and trying to do and why, I agreed to be part of the group in any way, shape, or form that I could. One of the things that, that I value, again, growing up the way that I did, is the love for Mother Earth. Because, again, my grandparents said we are related to all creation. That's why we call Mother Earth, Mother Earth. And that's why we consider all creation our relatives. And before 1492, and probably even into the earlier mid-1800s, we could probably go anywhere and drink water and swim and fish. I'm Apache. We don't fish. Some of us now eat fish a little bit. I'm one of them. But traditionally, we didn't because it wasn't around, you know. We didn't have the fish people. But we had the respect for all life. We had the care to protect respectfully and with love. When we go out, <laughs> well, when I go out, and even though I have trouble walking now, but I, I am so thankful that I'm able to put one foot on Mother Earth because I know that Mother Earth loves me, cares for me, and will help protect me and my people. How many times do we drive around, and I don't drive anymore, and you see somebody chunk a bunch of trash out the window or flick a cigarette butt out the window. And I have asked people, would you do that to your mother? And most people have understood, realized, and respected what I asked the way I asked and why. There have been some people who have the crooked spirit or maybe are the crooked spirit 
people have gotten very angry and in their own language told me what they think of me and my people. And that's their right, you know, I respect that. I don't like it. I pray for them. I think about them now and then. I wonder what kind of upbringing they had because we know that if we don't take of Mother Earth and if she dies, we die. Right now, we're having an incredible heat wave. We have been talking about, in my lifetime, the warming of the Earth, the change of the atmosphere. The old people used to say, if you don't take care of Mother Earth, she's going to die and you're going to die and now hopefully some of the people who did not believe or practice taking care of mother earth are realizing what is happening i was in the dallas area for years i got to dallas after college in 1972 did uh two years master's at the University of Texas Arlington. I had the honor and privilege of some white farmers and ranchers who knew some of about our traditions and culture who would ask me if I would come and do a land burning. So when it was asked and done that way, I did. And areas are of what are now like Frisco, toward Denton, north of Dallas. I did that in quite a few places. So we burned the grass, but I did ceremony with tobacco. I explained what I was doing, and we talked and walked their piece of Mother Earth and what they needed to do while we were doing the burning. So those of us that have grown up in our traditions, in our culture, that know those things and practice those things are far ahead, but we're still suffering. My son and daughter grew up listening to our stories, practicing our traditions, spent a lot of time around Indian people and Indian country. My grandsons are learning some of those things because I make sure that I talk and explain, including who their blood relatives are, but who their creation rel relatives are. And I have been around Indian country over the years enough to know that some of our young people are not getting that. In 1978, when I walked away from federal government, the biggest problem in Indian country was alcohol. I came back in 1980. Drugs had been introduced to the reservations. Incest, child abuse, neglect had also become prolific. In two years that I was gone, and it's still there. Why are so many of our women disappearing? Our people, but especially our women who represent Mother Earth. Without our women, we have nothing. Without our women being strong and knowledgeable, we are nothing. We won't survive. But because of what we have learned or chosen to learn and do from the outside society, we as people, and certainly we as men, have become very abusive. We have taken on what the Mexican people call the macho attitude. Me, 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 me. I, I, I doesn't work that way. So when Patricia, as my sister, and I talked about this, all of the values that you talked about are one. There's only one way of life, and that's the correct way, the traditional way, the red road way. We can separate, we can divide, doesn't matter. There's only one life giver. There's only one creator, there's only one great spirit, no matter what we call that entity. And if we do not respect ourselves and try and implement to the best of our ability, self-respect, self-love, love for all creation, care and protection for all creation, why are we here? Why are we here? Uh, who I have spoken. I'm going to say thank you in Yaki. That means chocotesia. Mm. Oh.
Thank you, friends and relatives, for listening to the Indigenous Podcast Without Borders. The music in this episode was called Fruto de Sonora and was composed by Ms. Soden on SoundCloud. If you are further interested in our organization, you can visit our website at indigenousalliance.org.